This is Gary Arbin. Arbin, you spelled right this time. Arbin. Arbin, yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Gary Arbin, as you all know. Um, I was born in New South Wales in Australia. It's the only New South Wales I think, anyway. Um, and at the age of seven, you know, my father, my father was a coal miner, my, my mother's a nurse. And at the age of seven, my father wanted to sort of pursue his career that he always wanted to do. He, he wanted to be a jockey. He just got a bit too much of the weight problem. So we ventured, we ventured overseas, to mainly to, to Holland. And um, my mother and all our children lived in Holland. My father, he rode in England and then in Germany, places like that, you know. And um, we went to school there for a couple of years and we moved back to... New South Wales, <coughs> and then we moved back to Holland again, travelled all around Europe, and then we moved over to England, lived in England for a couple of years, and then we moved back to Germany. So that was sort of pretty much my childhood up until about 17. In that time I changed school 11 times, um, three different countries, three different languages. So. My life was never really stable, like I wasn't a kid, just your normal kid that was sort of like, oh yeah, I was born up in, say, St Helens, went to St Helens Primary School and High School. Um, it was, you know, we were a really tight-knit family because we had to be, because we were travelling all over the world. And so we really got to rely on each other and trust, you know, it was, there was a bond there, a really good bond. And we were raised up as Catholics, um, like, you know, all you... Went to Catholic school when we were in New South Wales before we ended up going over to Europe. And, uh, you know, all the, did the Holy Communion and um, all that sort of stuff that they do there, you know. But I did believe in God. I believed in God then, you know. I'm like, oh, yeah, God's true and stuff, you know. But I just sort of couldn't understand it as a child. I mean, I was only seven, I'm going, all these prayers, you know, blah, blah, blah. Thinking, oh, it just, just didn't seem to make any sense, you know. Like every week, they say the same prayers, you know, and the rosary beads. And, and I thought, oh, bugger it, I'm just throwing that away. I'm making up my own prayers. So, you know, I made up my own prayers, and you know, I prayed most of those prayers most of my life. Good and when the times were good and bad, but usually when they were bad, because then you go, oh, God help me, you know, as we all seem to do. But anyway, after we'd been over to Europe for all those years, I was 17, came back to Australia. Um, we moved to Victoria, and um, my father sort of had a huge crash with his you know, racing career. Like, you know, there's not many bones left in his body, but, uh, you know, in one piece. And we sort of advised him. He was probably about my age, well, 42, you know, he's about my age then, and he said, you know, and you know, give it a miss. We just don't want to see it in a, in a wheelchair. So I gave it up and he bought him a feed store and I got a girlfriend, my old brother got a girlfriend, you know, and my young brother, he was doing his apprenticeship. Everything was going real fine. And all of a sudden, you know, I started drinking like everyone was drinking back then anyway, still today, but at that age, you know, you sort of start drinking, you get these are the real world, you know, pubs, women, all that sort of stuff. So my father went broke, lost everything that he earned all his life. He ran off with another woman and I sort of ended up having to run the whole business at the age of 19, which was a fruit, food produce store, like animals and stock feed and that sort of stuff. And um, consequently my girlfriend left, she'd just been through that with her family, with a big split up. So everything that was my comfort zone or my security, which I was saying before with my family, because we were so tight-knit, that all just went... <clears throat> and there I was standing, just nowhere, you know? Like, so, you know, I drank more. I was going out seven nights a week, getting drunk seven nights a week. Did that for about three years. I hadn't started smoking dope then yet. But, um, you know, always getting one woman this week, two or three the next week, you know, 
just looking forward in that, you know, I thought it was in the bed, but no, nah, there was no love in there. All my family's love was all gone. I was all hate and discontent, you know. And, and um, so anyway, while I was on my drinking, long drinking binge, I met this woman, my first wife, got married. Two years later, we were split up because the love still wasn't getting filled here in my heart, you know. Um, and uh, so anyway, she left, yeah, because we come to Tasmania and she left. And then uh, oh, only about a year after that, I met my, this other lady, young girl, who had become a second wife. Um, you know, we got married, but, you know, I did love her, but I didn't know what love was anymore because I didn't want to love anyone. Because <coughs> I already had this love for a family and I trusted my father so much and that, you know, that was just lost. I couldn't give my heart to anyone completely anymore because there's always this doubt. And um, so anyway, the last wife, we'll, we were married for six years, got three beautiful children, and um, moved from the north coast down to St Helens. And I thought, well, this is it. Have a new break, have a new start. You know, something's got to be going real good now. And things just went downhill. Didn't matter what I did, it's sort of like slow motion car accident, you know, you're just going off the road and you can see that tree doesn't matter which way you steer on the steering wheel, that tree's still coming, and then all of a sudden I just went bang. The family was split up. She did a run with my so called best mate. <laughs> you know, I heard a lot of people that's happened to these days. But um at that stage, I'm thinking, you know, oh yeah, at the time I was too smoking a lot of dope, you know. Been smoking dope for probably since I met my second wife. And just got worse and worse and worse. And yeah, I sprung on it. Didn't really sell it. I just grew it because uh, I didn't want to buy it. But because you grow it, you just got endless amount of supply. Like a beer in your fridge, you know, like it never runs out, you just keep drinking it, it's like I just kept smoking dope. So it all fell apart, <clears throat> and I thought, well, I'm going to go down, because I've had a lot of anger from unsolved things, you know, like I hadn't forgiven people, and I just hated people, and there's a lot of anger inside of me, and I thought, well, I'm going to drive down to Hobart, and I'm going to kill this place, you know, because I've done a lot of fighting in my life, you know, and now the pubs. You know, two brothers, we were always sort of, <laughs> you know, at each other all the time. So I want to go down, I want to go and kill this bloke. And that entered my mind then, and that was it, that seed was planted in my mind. Now I've got probably a thousand different ways that I was going to kill him. About two thousand ways of how to dispose of the body. And I look at it now, the only reason I didn't do it, because I didn't have the money to put petrol in my car. I didn't have $50 to put in my car for a return trip. God knew that now, God knew that then, which I know now. But um, I was living in a shack, you know, the wind was blowing through it. All my kids, who I love dearly, I spent a lot of time with, I just stripped away from them. You know, so the only bit of love that I had left was my children, that was gone. And I just found myself in a dribble and mess on the floor, you know, just crying my eyes out, you know. I had nothing left. 
And um, anyway, I took off to Victoria for a couple of months. I really thought I'm going to get over there and I, because um, I saw my ex-wife, or then she's still my wife. But, um, I saw her and I said, well, you know, can I take Liam with me just for a couple of months to sort my head out and see if I can get something worked out? So I can still let you go. Yeah, well, basically she just wanted me gone, you know. Yeah, yeah, take him too, because he was a problem child, as far as she was concerned. So I took him, and while I was over in Victoria, I was at my sister's place, and this lady walked in, and I thought, oh, I know this lady. I just know her. I didn't. But God did. And I was told my mum, I said, Mum, I said, oh, is that lady that was at my sister's place, you know? Oh, it's such and such. I said, oh, no. I said, oh, no. Anyway, she worked with my mother. And um, my mother spoke to me and said, look, Gary thinks that he knows you. And she said, oh, no, no, I don't know him. And so my mother told her my flight, you know, it split up and blah, blah. And, and she asked my mother, well, does he believe in God? And I said, yeah. And, uh, oh, okay. So anyway... A couple of days later, I received this little booklet from this lady with two other ladies. And they're in a prayer group over in Victoria. I don't know what denomination they are, but I still don't. I know her name was Shirley, that's all. And it was a little daily devotional. And I opened the front page and she wrote on it, Gary, even though we've never really met, God puts on our hearts those whom he wants saved. Jesus is your healer. And I just burst into tears and looked up and I went, you are true, because I've been praying and praying and praying, you know, and I'm going, you are true, you know. So from then on, like, I was in this daily devotional every day, you know, and <clears throat> anyway, I come back to Victoria, I sort of felt, you know, I could stand on my own to be feet just, but God was already leading me. Oh, I've got that money, but I think, oh, that'd be right, I've got this and that. Anyway, Pete was renting this place, which the house, the last house that I rented with my wife, ended up being Pete, whom I'd met before, about two years before. And there was this big shed attached to it, all my gear in there, cars and whatever. And uh, I thought, I'll go and knock on their door, see if it's all right, if I can just you know, fix up one of the cars or whatever, so I'll disturb them. Anyway, Poss walks out Pete's wife. And, oh, kid, I hear you going. And I heard they'd been going to church for a mutual friend of ours, Charlie. And I thought, oh yeah, that's good, you know, we go to church. And, uh, anyway, saw Pete a couple of days later. Oh yeah, he goes, I said, yeah, I'm going to kill this bloke, you know, and he's going, no, nah, you don't want to do that, you know. <laughs> Look, you know, because I'd see something different about Pete, like he's, yeah, he's just looked happy, and Pete's, no, no, you don't want to do that, and this, that, and the other. He said, come down to church, you know. It's better than I'd give his heart to the Lord, I think, about a year before or something like that. And, um, yeah, right, yeah, I'll do that. And Pete's gone, oh, thank you, that was easy. <laughs> yeah, like, I asked the son of the come to the church. And so anyway, I got there a couple of weeks later, and when I opened the church doors, I had my three children with me, and I walked into that church, and it was like this big vacuum just, Went in there because I'd had enough. I'd had enough dope. I'd had enough drinking. I'd had a, had enough of the life the way it's treated me. And people around me, you could see there's you know people busting up everywhere. Kids are running muck here, running over there. She's got a new husband. He's got a new wife. They've got new kids, and it's just a big a mess. You know, you just see it everywhere. I think we're all familiar with that. You know, and so I walked in that church and. God just, he had his hand on me, you know, like, and I haven't left really, I mean, I went back to Victoria, and that's another story, but after I, when I got baptised, when I first said, look, you know, the, the prayer and said to Jesus into my life, I went from a place of living in this shack where it was freezing cold, because I didn't have blankets, I went to the tip and got some blankets, and I was too proud, I wasn't going to go and have someone. I went to the tip, I was always a bit of a tip scrounger. 
and there happened to be two blankets. I thought, yeah, be I'm like, thanks, God. You provided me with blankets. Took them down the line about the stack of coin and washed them, took them back. I didn't have any power or nothing, but that didn't matter. I was sitting there, it's freezing cold. I went to bed. I had a Bible, a hand-me-down Bible, and I'm reading it. just felt this warmth coming over me. The only entertainment I had there was just watching the rats go past, you know. And, and I felt this warmth come over me. I think, oh, these blankets are good. You know, I'm reading this Bible. And I went to bed that night. I closed the Bible, went to bed. I woke up the next morning. You know, I, I was devastated in my life. My heart was smashed to pieces. My mind was just a wreck. You know, I went to bed that night and I wake up the next morning and the whole shack was just glowing, you know, it was like, it was like, it was like I was in fairyland, you know, I didn't know what was going on. And I had my arm out like that, I had this big smile on my face, I was just so happy inside, you know, I was in love. I was just in love and I'm thinking, Still half sort of asleep, not quite a lot, you know, totally awake. And I'm sort of thinking, well, I'm in love, like, who's that? Next thing I know, I was expecting there to be some woman of my life to be, you know, it was, it was the Lord. I believe it was the Lord, you know, I was just, so much peace came over me. I'm thinking, this can't be, like, this has got to be God, because here I am with a smile on my face, you know, like, living in rotten conditions and my life's just been smashed to pieces and I've never been able to go, oh well, switched on the smiley face and you know everything's rosy. And since that day, you know, like I've embraced God, you know, like and he is. Jesus is the truth, you know, the light and the way, you know, like I can't do without him anymore because he's the only thing that keeps me going. And I've seen a lot of testimonies and I've seen how it's changed people's lives. And just how he's blessing me day after day after day after week, you know, just with different things. I don't worry about money anymore. I used to make a lot of money, but I was always worried about it, even while I was making a lot of it. I don't worry about money. I don't worry about health. I don't tend to worry about many things, because if I do have a worry, you know, it's just, you know, to give it to the Lord, and I give it to the Lord. But the strangest thing, you know, back a long way when I, when I was a kid, I made up my own prayers. After I got baptised in the water and the Holy Spirit, and I heard these people praying. They were praying to us, just praying their prayers. And I'm going, yeah, they know my prayers. You know, like, mm -hmm. what are they doing? Praying my prayers. They must have been listening. I'm thinking, no, no, they couldn't be listening because I wish to say my prayers quietly in my bedroom, you know. I think God showed me. He's that showed me now, like three years later, three and a half years later. The Holy Spirit was teaching me as a child to pray to Him because I believed in Him. I only had a simple childlike faith. You know, I didn't have much understanding. And it is simplicity in Christ Jesus, as they say, you know. And God isn't a complicated God, you know. A lot of people portray Him to be so complicated and, you know, these scribes and these Pharisees and stuff like that, they used to have in the Old Testament, you know, they just, you know, Jesus says, was coming to me as a child. And I was a child then. I came to him and he hadn't left me. He'd been trying to call me, but I wasn't listening because I didn't know properly. And while I was away for a couple of years, my daughter, you know, I used to I speak to her on the phone, and I never taught her how to pray or anything. She came up to me one day when I could see her and she said, Dad, I've made up these new prayers. I'm you know, quite proud of my daughter. You know, she's one of the strongest evangelists I know out of anyone. If I was like, oh, she's this tall and that high. <laughs> you know? But um, she told me these prayers and I just burst into tears and I went, God, you know, they're the same prayers that you taught me as a child and he's taught my daughter them too. You know, God has 
got his hand on all of our lives, even though yeah. there are times when we think, oh, no, he doesn't know us or, you know, maybe he doesn't like me. But he has, even in our worst situations, he's, he's there with us, you know. So God is good. Mm-hmm.